Hello everyone and welcome back to COS, our course on commercial open source startups. We are in the third part and after introducing what startups are in the previous session, we will now look at how a startup can come out of research and specifically how you as a student might be working with a professorship or how you as a PhD student or wissenschaftlicher Mitarbeiter in at a professorship might want to work on a startup as part of your work and how to arrange all of this. So we have a couple of topics to discuss, uh, how to manage your projects, how to interact with each other, uh, how to have an open source strategy, and of course, testing the waters by open sourcing your work, getting users, getting contributors possibly. So research and startups at first glance don't go together well. Uh, research as an output has a goal, has research papers and a dissertation possibly for yourself. And so that is not code that is not validation of a business model. There is no business model. You want to publish research results. A startup, on the other hand, of course, is in search of a viable business model. So it wants to fill out that canvas with a business model canvas with validated hypotheses that describe its business model, that determine a value proposition. And so you build a product that fulfills that value proposition and get it to customers. Ultimately, the goal of a startup is the startup, a well-working organization in the end. So how to resolve that uh, goal conflict? Well, by changing gears over time. If you are a PhD student, uh, you have these two goals, get a dissertation, but also um, in this context, you want to build a startup from your work. So you have to simply manage your focus over time and initially you will start with a clear 100% focus on your research and over time shift it to uh, the startup. Where here startup means testing what people want and developing the supporting code for it. Uh, as you develop code, as you write programs as part of your dissertation to say support and evaluate research hypotheses, you can do so more or less elaborately, more or less throw away e or high quality uh, like. And so it is your choice of focus and quality based on how sure you feel that this code actually makes sense. In any case, you will quickly learn that you need some operating model of how to collaborate and how to manage that open source project. Uh, this is where a professor comes into play because that's usually the person who funds you if you're a PhD student or gives you the opportunity for a final thesis if you're a master's student. Also, it depends on whether you're part of a team or if you're going it alone. In the second case, in the so-called solo founder model, where you intend to be the sole founder of a startup, um, you have to, now again as a PhD student, have to play the engineering manager role and most likely, because you can't do everything, the professor at least initially plays the product management role. The difference is that the engineering manager is focusing on the product and on the software and managing that process while a product manager focuses on what's needed. That is true both in research as it is for a startup. As the engineering manager, you have the technical responsibility, so you're also the chief architect. Um, for the software being developed. So in this illustration here, you can see the roles, engineering management and product management as they apply to 
uh, being a research associate, meaning wissenschaftliche Mitarbeiterin or professor uh, at a university. And then as the research associate, you work with master's students, typically, who may be interested in joining you for the startup. But in the context of the open source project or the future commercial software product, they work for you and with you. And so you coordinate the work, you are the engineering manager. That changes a little bit when uh, you are part of a group. And uh, it doesn't change fundamentally because you still have responsibility for some part of the system. Now not the overall system, but some part of it that you're exploring for your dissertation and that you're responsible for later for your uh, for the product in a startup. But it's one of uh, multiple components because the other people in the group, most likely also uh, research associates interested in getting a dissertation, have to focus on their components. So you share work. But that is, in general, a preferable model to the solo founder model. I call it the peer group model based on the peer group uh, model of open source. Uh, because you have joined forces with other capable people and uh, you are forming a team. So it's not just you alone any longer. You can bounce off ideas. You also have to integrate your work with the other people's work. You're still mostly an engineering manager, but the professor working with you is now working with everyone in the peer group because they all want to get a PhD. And it is uh, the professor in their product management role gets higher level because the more people they have to work with, the thinner they get spread. So in that group now, you will find some rearrangement of responsibilities some distribution of responsibilities where you are not all doing exactly the same for just for your own component but based on your skills and competencies get broader so one of these may indeed more looking at product management one of these may be looking more at technical infrastructure and one of them may be looking more at a domain model in all cases uh, the research associates are and will remain supported by final thesis students. How the work is split uh, then is an open question. The immediate idea would be simply subsystems, but that doesn't necessarily mesh well with research because research is often cross-cutting. So as I just said, if some person is responsible for the domain model, that would address all systems and subsystems under development and so you all probably need a good understanding of the software and code base. A critical part of all of this is recruiting. Uh, the professor has to recruit the initial researchers or research associates and fund them. Uh, in Germany at least a research associate doesn't just get a stipend from the university, they get a full-blown salary, which is much more, it's much more lucrative to be a research associate at a German university than, say, a PhD student in some Anglo-Saxon dominated country. However, uh, those funds need to be acquired and that's what the professor has to do. The research associates and the professor also have to recruit further master students to work with the research associates and support them in their work. This is usually a win-win. Um, master students, final thesis students uh, choose projects they are interested in based on well what they are interested in. And uh, for that they need or want a broad set of options. And so university, multiple professors and their multiple projects will hopefully offer that to them. But to get there, they need to know about it. So the professor again and also the research associates by way of teaching effectively market the project and possibly recruit final thesis students. In my experience, the choices that final thesis students make 
depend on just a large number of parameters. Some go by technology. They are simply a web front-end programmer or they are a back-end programmer. Some go by domain, love scientific software, love middleware, love financial services software, and so forth. So there are many different ways of slicing and dicing what is attractive uh, to final thesis students, what to offer as final thesis, and thereby ultimately how to recruit effectively students to your projects. After the research project ended is uh, when you should be creating your startup, uh, possibly earlier, uh, certainly not much later, because when the research project finishes, there are no funds to go around any longer. A professor generally can only acquire funds for some promise of research and innovation. Uh, there are dedicated funds, as we will discuss later, for funding startups, but countries, states are generally very cautious about directly subsidizing startups because there are various EU laws against it. And so there's always some pre-competitive, not yet for the market type of innovation or research and development to be had. before you get the funds, can get the funds. Now, how does a research associate work with student engineers? Even if you're actually not interested in doing a startup, that would perhaps be of relevance to you now if you're thinking about a master thesis, for example, with us, because we all, or almost all, follow this, man, uh, this, um, this model that I call the lead engineering model. That name is ba based on an old term that's not quite fitting, but that is similar, um, even though it doesn't sound so good, uh, called the chief programmer teams. So the idea is that there is a central person who is the lead engineer, at least for the component. Um, so in the solo founder model, the lead engineer is the lead engineer of everything. In the um, peer group model, the lead engineer, there are multiple. Each research associate is a lead engineer for some particular aspect of the system. And so they lead the development of that aspect of the system Sometimes it's, again, it's a subsystem. Sometimes it's a cross-cutting aspect. They are responsible for the architectural integrity of that aspect or component. They certainly coordinate that with the rest of the peer group if there is one. So they need to have a vision and they need to enforce that vision and they need to get it done with the help of, well, our final thesis students and their own work. These are ultimately engineering managers, again, or project managers, even though we're aiming to have a startup and a product, not just a project. But initially, it is a research project. So they manage effectively people as they contribute to the software. It's very much like an open source. The lead engineer is a committer, and final thesis students are the contributors. So the lead engineer plays the reviewer role. They coach final thesis students, they write tickets, they write backlog entries into a project board and students pick them up, uh, implement them. Well, first of all, should engage in the discussion what it means and then hopefully implement them, send back merge requests and so forth. So the lead engineer needs to engage with their final thesis students along the way and manage them to, to be successful. Again, initially these are master students. Later on, it's possibly open source volunteers. So a lot of terms are flying around now. Uh, these are roles of people, but they are always really, really the same. There's a context that determines which of the terms or the words you use, but they really mean the same. 
So there's always a leader or a lead role and then those helping or supporting uh, folks. So the PhD student is supported by master student, the graduate researcher by research assistant. So it's pretty much the same as PhD student and master student. The lead engineer by student is supported by student engineers. The committer in an open source project is supported by contributors. And in a company, you'll have co-founders who need early employees to support them in getting the company off the ground. These roles of leading and helping exist in many forms and guises here. They all pretty much mean the same. So going back to how does a research associate, my folks, my PhD students, are my wissenschaftliche MitarbeiterInnen work with final thesis students. Well, again, the lead engineer uh, defines features from the research project, what they want to see, what they want to get done in the overall source code base of the project. They define those features, they possibly break them down into tasks and they either wait for volunteers or if they already are working with a master student or final thesis student on it, then uh, assign those broken down tasks to people. Uh, this assignment is not a problem if you have that agreement on a final thesis and it's pretty obvious then who gets to do what. Also, it can be the inverse. The um, lead engineer simply provides those features and tasks and student developers pick them up as they have time to work on the project. Like an open source, it's important that the student engineer doesn't just blindly do something but rather they see a feature uh, or a task, they decide that's what they want to work on or it seems like it would be something they want to work on and rather than jumping into the cold water they actually engage in a discussion, they clarify what it means verbally or in an issue tracker or some thread discussion by supported by a tool. Such discussion should be public. Others want to listen in, possibly even comment. That's at least how it is in open source, but it's also preferable in a closed setting. And then a good student engineer with some initial understanding of what needs to be done breaks the work down further into tasks and comes back with small merge requests, each of them being one step towards a full solution of some task or feature and one step on the way to that with an explanation of how they intend to go there. Why is it so important that you take small steps? Because small commits get in or small patches get in, small merge requests get in. Huge merge requests drain the time of the lead engineer in one setting way too much. It will be much harder to understand large complex pro proposed large complex changes. It's much easier to understand small incremental changes. So don't run into the wall head between arms, between shoulders, but rather Think smartly about the work you're going to do and break it down into small manageable pieces that are reviewable, that the lead engineer can take a look at, can wrap the head around and accept if it's ready uh, without much of a headache. It's quite important that, so there may be some back and forth, some interaction, but in the end, of course, you want the lead engineer to accept your merge request. Nothing's more frustrating on both sides if your merge request is just waiting, waiting and doesn't get worked on. And once you've found that habit, this is how you get features done. Small steps one after another until a feature is fully implemented. So the software forges in this second incarnation after the original source forge as we see it with GitHub and GitLab really make life easier in that respect. So they are have made my work so much more effective it's hard to believe that only 10 years ago we didn't have those. So you use such a uh, you use such a uh, software forge 
And um, here's a screenshot from Cudacity, one of our project, where um, you can see an overview what it means to run a real project at a university. Um, so you can see the commits, branches, tags, there's some actual work going on. So have a project on a software forge professionally managed with good software. Essential project. That doesn't mean you have to give everyone or that everyone will receive change rights or commit rights to the core repository. A common pattern of splitting work is simply to have one large repository, one central repository, and then give every student, here you can see a list, uh, give them all their own project to work on, from which they will send merge requests. So we are following here a distributed development workflow where you are not cloning to your local workstation the uh, original repository, but you're first cloning it to another one on the, uh, on the main service and to which you have full write rights. And from that you send your merge request to the main project. So you can use the full set of features and functionalities here that uh, GitLab in our case offers you. And so you can use the back and forth on some feature and so forth. It also comes with issue management. So it's very nice to have good issue management, obviously, because that's how the lead engineer structures their work uh, and ultimately your work. And it also allows multiple people to chime in. So Cudacity, as of the time of talking about this, has three main developers, three lead engineers and multiple multiple students working on it all the time. Here you can see the issues put on a project board or the uh, on a GitLab project board where you can not only see the issues but see the stage they're in, how they move from having been created, being available to, to do, ready for doing, then actually doing and finally in review. The key here is again, like an open source, that there is a review by a lead engineer of a supposedly finished feature or step along the way to a feature. And uh, that is where the review takes place in the form of a merge request that you're communicating on. So it's not necessarily um, a Scrum-like review meeting most of the development at a university doesn't really proceed like Scrum in a, thus in a commercial context. Uh, we are all too distributed, um, working too independently. So it all takes place through tools and there are no sprints. Things are ready when they are ready. And so that works well because people have different capabilities and don't like necessarily being put into a time harness uh, time boxes like in, in Scrum. Um, things end up in review when they're ready for review and that's it and then they will get reviewed. Um, so you can see how that set of how finishing an issue, moving it to in review and sending the corresponding merge request um, leads to that merge request backlog for the lead engineers. Uh, it does not lead to any automatic acceptance of the merge request or that the issue that is in review is moved to closed or finished, but rather in that merge request, as you probably know, the lead engineer and the student engineer will collaborate or discuss the feature. Does it fulfill the definition of done criteria if you have some, or at least does it pass muster the conceptual and technical review of the architect, meaning the lead engineer. You can see that here in a thread discussion um, for some merge request. Um, the lead engineer who sees your merge request may have some questions, may ask you about it, may annotate your code, thereby giving you comments on how to improve, and you have and should react to that speedily, ideally. So you get that 
discussion and ultimately hopefully a resolution of any issues there are and the acceptance of the merge request into the main line or into whatever branch you've been submitting to. There are more considerations for how to set up your work. In the Qdacity case, you saw a single big repository and uh, that is sometimes warranted. It makes things easier. Sometimes technologies, technicalities get in the way like JavaScript libraries not being so nice and then you want everything in one repository so you can move fast. You can also break things into many repositories and then maybe you get more independence but maybe you don't move as fast as you wished and so forth. And similarly you need to have a model of how you work with branches. Uh, I think after in the past people loved to work in branches and feature branches they are much more all focused these days on keeping things integrated and thereby committing so sending merge requests and committing and integrating into a main line sooner rather than later it simply takes a lot of time to review complex merge requests so you want to keep it simple you want to make each merge request to be small so that you don't have to wait too long and get out of sync too often. Um, this is a way of optimizing how where your intellectual capacity goes, where the lead engineer's intellectual attention goes, because if they have to jump around and get two big merge requests that they have to spend a lot of time catching up on, um, the difference, the old state that this merge request may have been initially referring to, then either the lead engineer has to fight with that or you have to fight with it as you're catching up for the main line, uh, for the current state of the main line before you send your merge request. So since we're talking about commercial open source startups, you obviously should have an open source strategy. In any project really that has potential commercial interests, you need to understand where those lie. And here you can see a schematic depiction of that. Um, you, one model or the one that I use breaks functionality or features of the overall project into three different categories into features that are functionality that's not differentiating in any commercial sense. That is a reason to use in a commercial or practical sense and that is a reason to you buy in a commercial sense. Examples of non-differentiating features is say in some editor the ability uh, to load your work. Loading and saving documents has not made anyone buy a software or use a software it's taken for granted so it's not differentiating in any way it doesn't make anyone come people come because of the basic functionality if it's a graphical editor can you edit graphics nicely or not that's the main reason to use and then if you um, have something that uh, customers don't easily have uh, that you can withhold without upsetting users, so users, not customers yet, then uh, you have some reason to buy. That could be, again, hosting the software in the cloud. Could also be, in the case of a graphical editor, some elaborating templating, some diagrammatic notation that only an extension that customers, that users have to pay for provides and so forth. So that's the difference between features that are not differentiating, that are a reason to use and that are a reason to buy. And of course, you need to uh, find those reason to buy features and be careful in distinguishing them from reason to use. Non-differentiating non features, there will be plenty of. So with these three categories, question is, um, 
what are the licenses, so what are the intellectual property regulations around it, and also who works on it, how and why and when. So first of all, the non-competitively non differentiating features, they have no commercial value to you. So they just create costs. And so you'd be more than happy in general to share their development with a community. So that would be makes them true community open source. And you don't mind if someone else A, participates and contributes, you actually like that, and B, you don't mind that the license, that it's open source and that uh, others can, can also use it. You still don't want it to be a copyleft license, obviously, but uh, as long as it's a permissive license, it doesn't matter to you if others have their copyright in there, meaning you split the ownership between a community and yourself, the university. For the reason to use features, um, the uh, copyright should be all yours because that's what you work with. But in terms of what it is that you develop, so I'm making a distinction here between product and process, but in terms of process and governance and determining what to work on, well, that is something you can discuss with the, universe, with the community and give them a say. So um, we can distinguish between um, the product and the IP of the product, which in case of reason to use features, the university needs to own all of it. And in case of non-differentiating features, the university doesn't quite bother. Uh, it can be shared ownership and thereby the license is effectively fixed because you can't easily change the license after the fact if there are too many stakeholders or owners. And in terms of governance and process, you don't mind the governance of non-differentiating features to be pretty much by the community, but you do mind the governance process of reason to use features where you do let your community have a say but ultimately you still manage it yourself because, well, reason to use features are something you should be paying attention to. Finally, again, we have those reason to buy features, which is something that you can't be providing for free. Otherwise, there is no buy, no payments. And so you have to own all the IP and you also manage the process and the development yourself and it's obviously closed. So we're talking about closed source, closed roadmap, closed governance and so forth within the university initially and later your startup. So this is the same whether uh, you're at the university still thinking ahead towards a startup or, the, uh, or a company already uh, being a startup working on a commercial open source strategy. It so happens that it's fluid whether features are non-differentiating, reason to use or reason to buy. One way of how things flow is that what used to be a reason to buy becomes competitive in that others also have it. It's still a good feature, it's still a reason to use, but others are competing, other projects, other products, other companies are competing. So you may decide to give it away for free, lest some competitor uses such a feature to acquire your users and wean them away from you. So reason to buy features can become reason to use features to make sure that that user base, freeloading, but from which you might generate customers later on, uh, stays with you. So that's why you start giving away at some point of time uh, reason to buy features as reason to use features. And same thing with some things becoming so ubiquitous that they're not even reason to use any longer. These features become competitively non-differentiating. And so you might let go of your uh, IP and community uh, control that you still have for reason to use features. 
And even beyond that is a step if something becomes such a base technology, you really don't even want to be involved in its management or maintenance of IP rights any longer. So you completely push it out to some foundation perhaps under their guidance and umbrella and the community and you're only really just a regular member of that community then. Interestingly enough, it can also flow the other way. So there can be features that uh, looked like they were just general features available elsewhere under in a free and community open source setting. You might want to pull them in because you see potential for them. This typically means you can't use the code, but you can replicate or repeat an implementation of it under your rules. And if you see that actually as a future path, you may have to be more careful about IP rights. So you might pull in observations about smart functionality elsewhere, that is pure community software, open source software elsewhere, and pull them into your community. And even pull them on further into reason to use into your code base, which is a reason to use code base of features and under more tight control by you. And you can even pull it in further into a reason to buy. Now, this pulling in could be one step from something you observe directly into closed source. It could be done in incremental step steps with the notion that, oh, I will need that later as closed source as well. So that is tricky if it looks like you might be taking away something from the community. So in general, you are never taking something away. What you're just doing is you're slowing the public, the development of what's public, and you're expediting the internal development and the next generation of these features in your product. So it's pretty much a simple, straightforward uh, conclusion, never to uh, remove features, never take something away that you gave to your community already. But what you can do is not freely give away the next revision, the next version, the upgrade of that feature to the next version, but uh, to either be more slowly about it or not as complete and so forth. And that is more easily understandable to users. In general, though, as was the argument with cloud software, don't really try to find a very hard distinction between what is public and reason to use versus what is reason to buy. Ideally, it's a hard delineation like on-premise versus in the cloud. You may have heard about the rallying cry, uh, public money, public code, uh, suggesting that all code written using public money uh, at universities or elsewhere uh, should be public code, meaning open source code, basically using an open source license. But I don't think that will generally be true because, first of all, in by law, universities actually have a, a task with not just performing public nonprofit research, but actually also exploiting it. So the state has tasked a university like ours with not only doing good and performing research, but also finding ways of exploiting that. The state wants that from us. So as a consequence, the university really has these two arms, the nonprofit pure research and the commercial exploitation, all the way to different parts of the university, sometimes charging VAT and sometimes not. Which part your work as a PhD student or as a contributing master student falls into is the university's choice. Um, and um, that's how it is. You may wonder now why professors uh, as agents of the university decide to open source something. And I think there are three main reasons to be aware of. And the first one is that Sometimes professors or research associates simply dump code 
on the web uh, to document their research. Um, as you make claims about how you tested some research hypotheses with your data, other researchers may want to see the code by which you performed those tests and that means they need to be able to replicate your work and for that they need your software, including bugs and what have you. So that would usually lead to a code dump. That's not a project, that's just a code dump. But it's necessary and valuable from a research perspective to document how you performed a research experiment that way. Sometimes software is much better than that though, not just one shot one hypothesis test software, but really useful software that, say, the professor would like to be sustainable, to be more broadly used, and they have no commercial interest for it. Then they want to create a community, then they will choose to open source to make the software sustainable. That's the goal. And that would make it community open source software, not commercial, community open source software. This is tricky. Uh, the professor actually, or the research associates, have to spend extra time, extra money effectively, uh, to turn some internal piece of code into a useful open source software. That is extra investment that takes away from the time available for research. But maybe it's uh, useful in particular if this, or a good idea in particular if the software benefits from such sustainability and so does the university or the professors perhaps because their research is based on it uh, or simply because they like doing it. Finally, there's the reason why this course now exists. You want to commercialize software and you choose a commercial open source strategy. So professors or their research associates can also decide to commercialize the work of they do at the university. And this then leads into this course and the strategies discussed here. And that's the third option. As you do so, uh, you open source and you want to have a well-working open source project. Otherwise, it's really just a code dump or just developing software under the public eye without any users or contributions, which happens to be not a lot of fun. You really want to get users, that's where the fun and also the stress starts. And of course, you want to poss possibly get contributions so that uh, maybe you can recruit people. So here's a set of best practices on setting up an open source research project and finding your way to a first user. It's all very pedestrian, nothing, no rocket science here. If you want to have users, you need to make it possible for those users to find you. So have a good name for your project. Have it in some place that people can find. Have a project page that talks about what it is and register your project page, your website in all relevant places. These days that's GitHub and maybe a separate project site, website, but mostly GitHub. As people look at your project, so maybe they found it through a search engine, as they look at your project now, you need to inspire trust. Because what you want is that the onlooker spends time on you by using your software. There's quite the gap from looking at something and being able to use it. So you want to make it easy to use the software. So make that easy by providing all relevant information, telling users about the license, making, uh, uh, having, practicing open communication on who you are and where you want to go to. If there's anything sensitive, explain it. Why is it copy left or not? And of course, in your communication, do not come across as a crazy-eyed person. Be a matter of fact and civil and uh, proper. After inspiring trust comes the decision of the visitor to become a user. So you want that to be easy. Um, the many ways of making it easy to use your software. 
have a demo on the site, for example. Provide a downloadable Docker image. That's one of the easier ways of installing the software these days. Um, as users somehow find their way to an executable instance of your software, you may make life even easier by helping them understand the use cases and helping users understand actually why they are there. The user may have an issue, may have a problem, but maybe they're looking at it in the wrong way. And so as you present use cases, which are your hypotheses of why customer users use, as you present these use cases, help users or visitors sort themselves into these user buckets and then guide them towards a successful experience. Why do you want the experience to be successful? Well, you don't want them to run away after first use. You want them to keep using the software and getting the value out of the software that you see for the user in the free to use version of your software. Users are not contributors. So users will just use your software and of many users you may never hear, which is just fine. That is how open source works. But it would be smart to know who your users are in that sense that who downloaded the software and possibly even are they still using it. So there are many different ways of how you establish that first connection and possibly maintain it over time. You could ask, for example, for the email address at the very moment where they download a Docker image or do something similar to it or offer them to update them about changes. The moment they engage with your website is when they are most likely to agree to provide you some information on how to reach them and then use that information widely, of course. So have some announcement channel that people can subscribe to, etc. Do all of that following common best practices because you want people not to be surprised by your behavior. So if you have an announcement channel, then don't start a discussion there, but really just announce people in reasonable, announce new information in reasonable intervals and in reasonable information time distances. So getting users is one thing. Uh, maybe you're totally professional and your user and your software even has a heartbeat so you know when they are using it. Um, and you can reach out to them because you have their email address, what have you. You typically then or possibly may want to take a second step. Uh, in general, community open source, sometimes less so in commercial open source, but in commercial open source, certainly for community non-differentiating features as well. Try to lead them to give you contributions. Contributions create buy-in. Not only do you get software, you get actually, if it works well, more engaged users because they are now contributors. Those who are the marketeers for you, the free marketing uh, providers because they like your software, they talk about it, they go to user conferences and so forth. So as you found users, you probably engaged with them already. So say hi. Um, don't be uh, obnoxious, but say hi in some form. If they already come and give you a signal by writing something in a forum or a mailing list, certainly say hi and show that you recognize they are there. Um, as they come because maybe they want to contribute, there are different reasons why they come, maybe they are bored, more likely uh, they have a question, um, better yet they have a bug uh, they want to report about or even have a fix for a bug. As they come with this intention, make it easy for them to contribute. So those who are just looking to do something fun on the weekend, for those you need the so-called so -called good first issue, a simple feature to implement to get started, kind of just try things. This is really a best practice of the sorts that 
on your GitHub or in a GitHub pro GitLab project, you should mark some features, some issues as easy to do, good first ones. Um, provide a guide of how to contribute, code of conduct, not what to expect. Provide simple tasks and more complex tasks, not just for the good first issue, but for later more complex issues as well. As you, as folks do that, you'll end up communicating with them. It's like with the lead engineer discussed earlier. If you want to get useful contributions, you need to engage with the people. You need to talk with them. You need to make sure that whatever they might be sending you in the future makes sense and is not a raw code, code dump that you can't really work with. So communicate with them. As you do so, um, some of the basic patterns apply, like assume good faith. People are not stupid. People are not malicious in almost all situations. So assume they are there with good faith and, um, and, and act accordingly. Um, speak to issues, not the person. Don't let any personal issues hang out. Certainly always praise if someone spends their time freely and voluntarily if you have to criticize something, be very specific. Don't, again, let the person get in the way, focus on the issue and very specifically say what you think needs changing. As you work with folks, now contributors or volunteers in an open source project, you absolutely has, have to stick by the basic open source rules of practicing code review, um, Unless you want to be pulling code all the time, you, as the committer, review code, possibly send it back, and only after review, accept the code into the code base. Um, as discussed with respect to the TikiWiki project a while back, it is possible to give commit rights to everyone pretty quickly, but it does come with potential reputation loss or the need for quality assurance mechanisms some other way rather than uh, peer review. And then again, engage contributors after the first contribution. Don't let them wait. Don't uh, demotivate them. Try to do as much as you can in the public, in the open, so that others can see it, can communicate it, even asynchronously. Google and other search engines remain your friend. People may get to your public thread years later and still benefit from it. And it saves you time if you did it publicly. So communicate openly and publicly as much as you can. And of course, know how to do that. Um, understand the needs of your contributors, why they are there, which use cases they fall into as users initially and then as contributors. As you go from one initial contribution to sustained contribution, you are building trust with people. So that also relies on open collaboration, being fair to them, not hiding work from them, being respectful of their needs and so forth. Again, everything should be public and you should also again be praising publicly and plentifully. Even small successes can be celebrated. There are lots of good community management rules here. One of the harder things with commercial open source is to maintain the integrity of the intellectual property as needed for your potential business. So you simply need to watch that. Have a contributor license agreement or have a, a developer certificate of origin. Um, GitHub and GitLab give you tools for managing those. And I think contributor license agreements are less controversial today than they used to be maybe only five years ago. So you don't necessarily have to expect a lot of pushback on those. So that's it from me for, for this session. We looked at how out of research you might create uh, how a research project can and should be managed with an eye towards being an open source project and ultimately a startup. So that, that starting up uh, is still outstanding. Next session, we looked at how you manage the project at the university and towards 
an open source project and how you can possibly find users and acquire contributors. So thank you very much for your time and attention for now and see you in the next session.